the Holy Spirit, and we just invite you to stir our hearts, help us to be convicted by your truth, by your word, help us to be awakened uh, to your truth, to a greater reality. So God, I just pray that all of us here would have uh, hearts that are open, hearts that are humble and submitted before you. We thank you for your presence here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, for those of you uh, who were with me uh, last week, we started a sermon series on the book of Psalms. Uh, and I showed you guys a meditation guide by someone named Martin Luther. So if you can just show that up real quick. Um, if you remember, this is the meditation guide that I, I provided for you all, and this is what we're going to use uh, to study the Book of Psalms, meditate it together. So just going over it again, it is uh, tax, T-A-C-S, uh, basically what is the teaching in this passage, how can I adore God as I read this passage, how can I confess or repent something based on this word, and what can I ask God for? based on what I've read. So supplication, what can I ask God for? So, um, you know, I don't know if you guys are able to, to follow along with uh, the meditations for this week, but uh, if you remember, I listed uh, a bunch of Psalms for you guys to, to meditate on this past weekend. As I was reading through the Psalms myself, uh, I was really seeing things that I had never seen before in the Psalms. There were, there were words that jumped out at me. There were uh, concepts and ideas that I never saw there before. And there were insights that uh, really made me repent as I looked at it. Uh, so I don't know how it's been for you, but for me it's been uh, really just a new way of looking at the Psalms. And it's been really helpful for me to uh, come at the Psalms with these four very clear ways of uh, looking at this word. So, yeah, it's been great for me. I hope that, you know, if you haven't started it, I hope that maybe you can start this week. There are, uh, you know, I think there are six new passages, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Six new passages. If you check on the back of your bulletin, it should be there. There are six new psalms for you to meditate on. And we're going to continue to uh, meditate on the psalms together uh, and do this journey together. Now, I don't know if you're anything like me, um, I, I shared with you last week that I'm, I'm a very analytical thinker. Uh, I, I, like, I like hard facts, I like data, I like things that are very clear. So, you know, I, I would read the Psalms and I would wonder, am I, allowed to, uh, am I allowed to think these things that the Psalmists are talking about? Am I allowed to be this angry? Am I allowed to be this upset with God? So, you know, I, I wonder if this was okay, and I used to read the Psalms primarily as an observer. Right? So I'm on the outside, and I'm looking at these stories of, of people who are feeling these things, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm kind of analyzing what they're feeling. I'm analyzing the, the correctness of what they're thinking, and is this correct theology? So I used to look at the Psalms that way, as an outside observer, looking in and saying, okay, these are interesting stories, uh, this is, you know, this is interesting. But lately, uh, as, I, as I shared, I've been really stepping into the Psalms. Uh, and it's really challenged me, because sometimes I feel down, and sometimes I feel spiritually down, or sad, and when I read a psalm that's about celebration, I have to step into that person's shoes and celebrate the goodness of God, celebrate the power and faithfulness of God. Or when I feel happy, I'm, I'm feeling good and things are going well, but the psalm is about sadness, uh, grief, and then I have to step into the shoes of someone who has lost everything, feels like God has totally abandoned them. But that's very challenging. It's a totally, like, before I was just kind of separate, right, distant from the Psalms. Now I'm, I'm stepping into their world and it's very uncomfortable uh, because it challenges what I'm feeling in the moment. So this is what empathy is. Empathy uh, is just learning to journey and to feel 
what someone else is feeling. So this is, this is the most basic skill that you need uh, in any relationship. Learning how to empathize with someone, learning what it is like for that person's world. Uh, so it's helped me to grow in empathy, but it's also helped me to realize uh, that I don't have to be controlled by my emotions. Uh, I may be happy in one moment, uh, but I can step into and feel and journey with someone who's sad. I may be sad and depressed in one moment, but I can step into the world of someone who's joyful and happy and enjoy what that person's feeling. So I'm not, I realize I don't have to be a slave to my current feelings. I don't, they don't own me or control me. Now, the psalm that we have today, Psalm 42, this psalm is called a masco. Uh, a masco was basically, uh, some people interpret it or, or define it as a teaching or some kind of instruction. So, going back to last week, if you remember, I said the purpose of the Psalms is uh, to express your thoughts and to express your emotions. So, it is both how you think and it is also how you feel. Okay, so, so for me, just remember I shared with you, uh, for me, mostly when I looked at the Psalms, I was thinking. Right? I was analyzing, I was breaking down but I wasn't really feeling. And maybe for some of you, when you read the Psalms, maybe you're more of a feeler. Maybe when you read the Psalms, you're more feeling, uh, but you're not really uh, thinking as much. You're not really analyzing as much, but you need uh, both elements. And remember, I told you that uh, the real way to, to think and feel through it, though, uh, is to submit to the Word. Not to say this is how I should feel about this or how I should think about this, but to allow the psalm to change your mind, to change your heart. Now, this psalm, it deals with something that every Christian will go through or has gone through, or maybe you're going through it now. One pastor called this spiritual depression. Now, I think I've mentioned this before, but if I was in charge of what goes in the Bible and what doesn't go in the Bible, um, I would never put in something like this. I would never put in something that deals with spiritual depression because it, it's not something that I would think would be edifying. It's not something that I would think would bless people. Why would you put in something that is so sad and, and is your, you know, this person is questioning God and you know, I would I wouldn't put this in. You know, when you go to a funeral, um, you know you shouldn't be happy, right? This is very obvious. When you go to a funeral, you don't go in with a huge smile on your face. You don't go in laughing. You don't tell jokes. That's not what you do. Uh, something terrible has happened, right? So you shouldn't be happy. You shouldn't be joyful. How could you be happy when something so tragic has happened? I think sometimes we feel this way about spiritual depression. And what I'm trying to say is, uh, people will say, well, you're a Christian. So don't you know that you have everything in Jesus? Don't you know that you're loved and you're accepted and you're a son and daughter of God? So how can you be unhappy knowing that God loves you? How can you be so sad knowing that you have everything in Jesus, that you have heaven waiting for you? So sometimes, we might think, or maybe people have told us, you're not allowed to be unhappy as a Christian. That, that is so unedifying. That's not Christian to be unhappy like that. But this writer, so interesting, this writer who also happens to be a worship leader, is very clearly depressed, very clearly very down, and very sad. In verse 3, if we can have verse 3 up, we see that he's crying day and night. Uh, you see that it says his food is, is his tears. He's, he's so sad, he's weeping all night. 
So people around him are, are looking at his life and they're saying, where is your God? Where is your God? How can you say that God is with you when your life looks like this? How can you say that you are blessed by God, that you have everything in God, when look at your life, look at the way you're, you're living your life, look at what you have or you don't have. I mean, can you really say that God is with you? And this, this writer, the author of the psalm, it's clear, it's very clear that he believes God's not with me. He's downcast, he's lonely, he feels abandoned. He feels like I'm totally alone in this. Now, I wonder how many of you can relate to this feeling. I wonder if some of you may be feeling this right now. I wonder if some of you have just gone through it, or maybe some of you are going to experience something like this. But I promise you, every Christian experiences this. Every Christian. Whether you're a mature Christian or an immature Christian, you're young or old, it doesn't matter. Everyone experiences this kind of spiritual depression. You know, I've been blessed by God to have a family who is mostly Christian. My, my father is a pastor, my mother is a pastor, my grandfather is a pastor, uh, I have other relatives who are a pastor. On my, on my wife's side, her grandfather is a pastor, uh, my, my father's sister's son is a pastor. I mean, there's so many pastors in my family. I've been blessed to have all these strong Christians in my family. And so when I struggle, people pray for me. Right? There are many people praying for me. People understand me. They remind me, God is like this. You know, they point out God is faithful. Don't worry, you know. And they, they show me, they, they even share testimonies to me so that you know, my faith is strengthened. But what's really hard for me is knowing what a lot of you are going through. Uh, because you, many of you have shared with me uh, your struggles. Many of you have shared with me your deepest pains. And it really breaks my heart. Because for some of your problems, or many of your problems, uh, I can't really do anything about it. Right? All I can do is pray. All I can do is pray for you and say, I'm praying for you. And sometimes that feels so empty. Like, I wish I could do something more for them than just pray. But I don't know, for their problem, that's, that's really all I can do. And sometimes, sometimes I want to tell God, you know, God, why can't you just give them what they want so that they won't ask, where is this God of yours? So that the people won't be tempted to think, where is this God that we're hearing all about? Why are my prayers like not answered? Why is my situation still like this? And sometimes I want to tell God, God, you know, don't you know your reputation is on the line? Don't you know that if you continue to let the situation go on, uh, it's not going to lead to good things. You're, you're stumbling people. And sometimes I'm tempted to, to feel that way. Or some of you have, have close friends or family who are Christian. And maybe you struggled with their questions when your life falls apart. Maybe your life is very difficult and your friends or your family are asking you, so where is this God of yours? So you say God is in control. So you say that God loves you. Then why, why, did, you, why did you lose your job? Then, okay, then why did you, you know, experience this tragedy in your life? If God is so good, if God loves you, then where is this God of yours? I don't know if you struggle with that. Maybe you have people close to you who ask questions like that of you. You know, it was in this place of very deep struggle and, and doubting from both outside, you know, people questioning, and inside, where is, where is my God? So outside, people are asking, where is your God? And inside, he's even asking, where is my God? Right? It's outside, inside. It's just this turmoil, right? This, this, this struggle in his heart. It's in the midst of this that we see in verse 9. If we can have verse 9 up. It says, I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? So his life is falling apart. He's wondering where is God. People around him are asking where is God. And he says, 
God, why have you forgotten me? Now let's think about what this question is saying. It's not, God, it feels like you forgot me. It is not, I wonder if you forgot me. It is, God, you forgot me, and I want to know why. Right? This is what this question is saying. God, you have forgotten me, and I want to know why you forgot me. Right? What is this? This is a straight accusation of God, that he has broken his promises to him. He's a direct questioning of God's character. You said you are faithful, but you forgot me, and I don't know why you forgot me. I want to know. The other thing that I want to point out that's interesting is that there's no confession of sin here. Uh, some Psalms, there is confession of sin. You know, they, they relate their problems to sin. So they say, you know, it's because I sinned against you, so forgive me, but there's no confession of sin here, and uh, it's because he probably didn't do anything wrong. Maybe it's just a situation that there are people who are uh, evil, people who are uh, not good people, who are hurting him, who are pressing him. Whatever the situation may be, this also adds to his confusion. He's confused. God, I didn't do anything wrong. Why, why is this happening to me? I know that Sometimes as, as Christians, we, we say, well, you know, when, some, when someone is suffering, we say, well, you know, you're suffering because you didn't do this, you didn't pray enough, you didn't fast enough, you didn't go to church enough, or, you know, or we say because it's because you did this, it's because you sinned in this way that it's happening, it's because you sinned in that way that this is happening. So, you know, we, we've been the ones who've said that maybe, or we've heard from other people uh, those same kind of things, right? We're experiencing struggle, uh, and maybe we've heard from people uh, who are saying we didn't do enough or we did too much of the wrong thing. And I'm not saying that that's always not the case. Sometimes sin is the reason. But when Jesus met a blind man at one point and people were asking, uh, who sinned to make this man blind? But why don't we have a passage up? I'll, I'll show it to you guys as I go through it. We can have the next passage up. Uh, if you look at this passage, let me just read it for you. It says, As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now this is a really interesting passage because the people around Jesus are operating on a very familiar concept, right? The one I just told you. Uh, clearly, if this person is suffering, this person is blind because of some great sin. Right? There is a direct correlation. But Jesus said, no. It's not because he sinned. It's not because his parents sinned. Uh, Actually, he says, by healing his blindness, God will be glorified. I want you to see that the psalm teaches us something very important. When we are deep in brokenness, and especially when the suffering has no clear reason, like we can't point to one reason, okay, it's because I sinned like this, or it's because I did this that there's suffering, especially when there's no clear reason. Uh, we are not always very careful with what we say. We are not very careful with our words. And we need to understand that with the Psalms, every word is honest. I mean, this is the rawest form of, rawest form of emotions, right? It's just an like, unfiltered expression of emotions. Every word is honest, but not every word is something you should follow. It's very important to know this. You know, this is why I said it's important to know how to read the Bible, and it's important to know how to read the Psalms. Uh, you're not called to react exactly like uh, the psalmist in every single situation. Sometimes it is just an expression <coughs> of emotion. It is just an expression of what it looks like 
to be a man of God, a woman of God, the struggles you face. This is why, even though the psalmist said, God forgot me, even though the psalmist said, God forgot me, he does not really mean that God forgot him. He feels like God forgot him. It feels, everything in him says, God forgot me, but he knows deep in his heart that this is not true. We know that the psalmist believes this because when we look at verse 8, he also says, God's love is with him every day. Every morning, he experiences the love of God. Every night, he experiences God singing over him. You know, after four years of marriage with my wife, this is not, I know that some of you have been married for a lot longer, um, but four years, after four years, we've been, in, we've been together long enough to have said a lot of things that we regret. Uh, this is the case for any couple, right? You, you, have, you put two people who are sinful together, eventually they're going to say some nasty things. Eventually they're going to say some things that they wish they hadn't said. Uh, and so when you get upset, when you get emotional, what happens? There's a very good chance you're going to say something that you wish you never said. And it's not even true. You exaggerate. You say things like, you always do this. Or you're always like that. Or you're never like this. Or, you know, we even like threaten to like separate. Or, you know, it's like, we say all these terrible things. Now, I probably shouldn't share any of the details of these arguments, uh, but you know what I'm trying to say here. Uh, we've all been in situations, maybe if not in marriage, if, you have, if you're not married, maybe if when you're with your close friends or close relatives, we've all been in situations where we've said things, we've exaggerated because we feel hurt. And so we want to accuse, we want to blame, we want to get back in some way. A pastor named John Piper, uh, what he called this is he said, these are words for the wind. Uh, and where he gets this, this from is from the book of Job. Uh, now some of you know the story of Job. Uh, Job experienced tragedy after tragedy, and in the end he lost everything. He lost his family, he lost all his wealth, he lost all his material possessions. And at one point, he was so emotional and he was so broken that he said some things about God that he regretted. And his friends criticized him. Uh, his friends said, Job, you can't, how could you say that about God? And I, want, I just want you to show you what Job said. Oh, it's, it's already up? Yeah. I'll read this for you. Um, actually, I can't, I can't read it here. I'll read it for you here. He said, do you think that you can reprove words when the speech of a despairing man is wind. Now, let me just break this down for you. Uh, what he's saying is, how can you criticize me like this? How can you tell me that I shouldn't speak like this when you know how broken and hurting I am? When you know that I'm a man full of despair right now? When you know that you know, these are just words for the wind. So he's saying, just let them go, please. Just let me, let me just say these things and you know that I don't really mean it. Let the wind take these words. And I think in the same way, we should show mercy in the same way. When, when your friends or, or family or people in the church, they're going through some very difficult times and they're really struggling and, you know, they say some things about God, like God is, I don't know, they, they say God is, God is not really love, or God, God forgot me, you know, God abandoned me. When you hear things like that, uh, show mercy, show grace. Most of the time, those are just words for the wind. Right? They come and go, it's not something you really mean. Job and the psalmist didn't really mean those things about God. And over time, uh, many times, you see that through their actions and their words, uh, 
we see their true beliefs. We see they don't really believe that. They, they really trust God. They really love God. Now, it's also important to ask, are your words really words of the wind, or are they words that are rooted in your heart? Uh, and that's also an important distinction to make. So although we should show mercy uh, when people, they, they say things about God in the heat of the moment, at the same time, we need to be very careful. Are these really words that I don't mean, or are these words that are coming from deep in my heart? Rooted words, a rooted truth. Now sometimes we as Christians, we ask, uh, why God? Why? And I've asked that question before too. And there are really uh, two paths that you can take when you ask this question. You can either ask God, God, how could you let my life fall apart like this when I've surrendered my life to you? Right, that is option one. You can go down this path of, God, I've given you and surrendered to you and how could you, in response, let my life become like this? That's option one. Option two is, God, I can't imagine where I would be right now in my mess and brokenness if you were not here with me. Do you see the difference there? One option says, God, you did not give me back a fair return. I gave you this much, but in return, you cursed me like this. That's option one. Option two is, God, I'm so glad that you're here with me and you've given me everything so that I can get through this time with you. So that I don't have to be alone through this with you. Do you see how those two are very different? They both, you know, come from a place of deep hurt and confusion, uh, but the path that the two take are very different. I want you to understand a very important theological truth that will help you to really be able to sustain yourself and not fall away when you suffer. This is a very important theological truth. And you need to grasp this, really have it deep in your heart if you want to suffer well, if you want to suffer appropriately. And this is Christianity at no point at no point does it ever promise the absence of storms in your life. It never promises that you will have no storms, but it does promise that Jesus will always be with you in the midst of your storms. That is a very important truth to remember. God never promises you will have no problems. God never promises that you will not have these kinds of problems. God never promises that you won't have problems that will completely break you down. But He does promise that in every level of your problems, from the smallest to the deepest to the broke, to the one that leads you to the greatest brokenness, He will be there in the midst of it. Whether it's in a sense of His presence, whether it's through the Word, whether it's through the church coming to your aid, whether it's through singing, whatever it may be, whatever form that God may take, He promises he will be there. I will be there in your midst. And I promise you, this is based on biblical truth and biblical promise. He will be there. He will be there. So look for Him. When you are suffering, if you are suffering right now, He is there in some form. Maybe you haven't recognized the form that He has come to you in, but He is there. Maybe it's a person, maybe it's a word, whatever it may be. Look for the God, look for God's presence in the midst of your pain. Now, one other thing I want to mention that I've been meditating on is this. Uh, many times we focus on what God did while He was on earth. But I want us to think about what God, or Jesus, God in the flesh, what Jesus didn't do while he was here on earth. And it's really interesting when you think about it. How easy would it have been for Jesus 
to become king of the world. It would have been super easy. He is the wisest, uh, most powerful, uh, you know, he has every resource at his command. Very quickly, very easily, with no effort at all, he could have been the emperor of planet Earth. And you know, if Jesus is the emperor, the ruler of the world, I mean, poverty is gone, uh, he's going to rule with perfect justice, right? He's not going to... He's not going to be affected by corruption. All the social problems that we deal with on earth, they're all gone, right? Because Jesus is the perfect ruler. He would, he would judge and he would rule with perfection. I mean, we would still mess up because of our sin, but he would rule perfectly. And he would know, he would know exactly how to rule this planet. I thought about that and I thought, that is, that is such a strange decision in some ways. It can almost feel like God made the wrong choice by sending Jesus to the cross instead of sending Jesus to the throne. Right? Why, why send him to die when he could have lived so well and fixed so many things? But I think that choice shows us what God believed was truly important and truly urgent. He died and he forgave our sins so that we could once again have an intimate relationship with the Father, with the truly holy God. And He's resurrected so that as empowered children of God, we can join Him in restoring the world, and bringing a new earth, a new heaven. This is what we see. We see that there is greater urgency, not in our problems, but in our relationship with God. Our relationship, the intimacy we have with God, that is the truly urgent thing. That is what Jesus came for, truly. Now, I want to go into some practical application here. Now, what are the ways that the psalmist battles his spiritual depression? Uh, he uses a variety of tactics to, to fight his spiritual depression. But the overall idea, even though he uses a variety of tactics, the overall idea is the same. He, what he does is he preaches to himself. Now I want to go through uh, three different passages, starting from verse 4. So if you can show those passages up, if you can show the next slide. So there are three passages here. And now I just want you to look at the way that the psalmist, he he practically attacks his spiritual depression. First thing is, he says, These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. Now, remember, he's a worship leader. So he's saying, oh, Remember those times when I was worshiping God with, with other people and I was leading them into worship and it was awesome. It was there was so much joy, there was so much celebration, and there were all these people, and I was pouring out my soul, and it was, it was so great. So he's remembering, worshiping with other believers. The second thing is, he reminds himself, I, I pointed this out to you before, of the love that he experiences uh, every day and every night. He says, by day the Lord commands his steadfast love. And at night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. And in verse 11, we have a, the clearest expression, example of a sermon to himself. He's speaking directly to himself. He says, why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Do you see how he's attacking his spiritual depression? Uh, he's using three different tactics here. He's trying to remember uh, those great times of worship and encounter with other believers. Right? So the church is important. Don't think that these kind of gatherings, these corporate worship gatherings, are not that important. These are very important to your faith. Right? These are things that, that sustain you. So he's remembering that. He's remembering that God's character is love. So he's always loving me. God is always loving me. He's sending his love down on me every day, every night. And then he speaks to his own soul. 
He's telling his soul, this is what you should believe. Now, I want to read a passage to you from uh, a famous preacher named Martin Lloyd-Jones, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, and I, I want you to, to read this together with you. If we can have the next slide up. It says, Have you realized that most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you are listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself? Take those thoughts that come to you the moment you wake up in the morning. You have not originated them, but they are talking to you. They bring back the problems of yesterday, etc. Somebody is talking. Who is talking to you? Yourself is talking to you. Now this man's treatment in Psalm 42, he's talking about our song, was this. Instead of allowing this self to talk to him, he starts talking to himself. Why art thou cast down, O my soul, he asks. His soul had been depressing him, crushing him. So he stands up and says, Self, listen for a moment. I will speak to you. I wonder how many of you have this discipline. This is a spiritual discipline. You know, I know you, you look at me and you say, I am the preacher, right? It is my job to preach. Uh, but actually, we all have to become preachers. You all have to become very good at preaching the gospel to yourself. You have to have the word so concretely in your heart and mind that you can apply it to yourself at every moment, speaking to yourself. You know, you need to realize that you do not have your own best interests in mind. That is not the way you function. Your heart is deceitful. Your mind is deceitful. Every day, your hearts, your minds, your desires are being turned away from God. Every day, every moment, the world is saying things that are contrary to God's word. Your friends, people around you, even other Christians, yourself even, you are deceiving yourself. You are in constant need of correction every day. Your thoughts and your heart, they are always going astray. We need constant correction. What is repentance? Repentance is the admission that the voice of God, His Word, is a greater voice than our voice. It has greater authority than what we believe. It has greater authority than what the world says is right. It has greater authority than what our closest friends or the experts say is right. Repentance is saying, I understand that these are not the greatest authority. You are the greatest authority. I, I, I repent of following those things, and I will now follow your word, your voice. We all have the Holy Spirit. If you are a child of God, if you surrendered your life to Jesus, then you have the Holy Spirit. You have great power to speak to yourself. The Holy Spirit will help you. The Holy Spirit helps you when you pray, and the Holy Spirit will help you when you preach to yourself. But we need to get into the habit of doing this all the time, and not letting the voices in our hearts run amok and run astray. You know, the message is very simple. Hope in God. Put your hope in Him. Because much of what you struggle with, much of your misery, much of your sadness, is really the result of hoping in something else. And this is where actually spiritual depression can be something of a blessing. This is where, uh, if you are right now, I don't know if you are again, but if you are right now in a spiritual desert, if you are in a season of dryness, then this is a blessing in some sense because it is in your desert season that you can see very clearly, well, more clearly than other times, the wrong things that you're hoping in. And you need to ask yourself, why am I so down? Why am I so sad? Is it really because I lost my job? Or is it because my hope is in truly succeeding in my career? Or showing, showing my friends that I made it? Where is my hope? Is my hope in something else other than Jesus? And is that why I'm so sad 
and depressed and broken right now. We need to ask our soul, soul, right, just like the psalmist, soul, why are you so sad? Why are you so downcast? What is it? Let me examine my heart and find out the improper hope. And let me re replace that, restructure it so that my hope is not placed in God, in Jesus. So begin by placing your hope in Jesus, trusting in Him, delighting in Him. Meditate on the Gospel. And as I said last week, you know, as we continue to go through the Psalms, I'm going to continue to encourage you. Let's put our roots deep into the Word, into Jesus. Let's drink deeply of Jesus. Meditate on Him every day because we need that constant correction. And let's speak to our own souls. Let's minister to our, to our souls. Let's preach to our souls with the Gospel as the Holy Spirit empowers you. Let's pray together.